I used to work at a summer camp in Ontario. While I was technically a camp counselor, I had the added responsibility of performing a lot of the maintenance tasks around the property. This was nice because I could still join in on camp activities if I wanted to. Or if the kids were acting up, I could just leave it to everyone else to deal with and go cut grass or hide out in the workshop tinkering with stuff for a bit. I probably had the best job there to be honest. The camp was located on the shoreline of a massive lake. There were two rows of cabins with a path between them leading down to the water where our dock jutted out into the lake. This is where we kept all our small sailboats, our rescue boat which was a Boston whaler and a couple of sea dews. Behind where the cabins were was mostly forest except for the five kilometer trail that led back out to the main road with a few cottages on it. A little ways up this trail there was a clearing where the staff all kept their cars and where the buses would park. There was also a large barn that we used as a workshop to build picnic tables and other things the camp might need. We also kept our two ATVs, a John Deere Gator, and a Kubota L-Series tractor with a few attachments in here. These were mostly used to move things around the camp and for various maintenance jobs. Changeover was probably the best time to be there. It was when the previous group of kids had all left, but the next group hadn't arrived yet, so we pretty much had the whole place to ourselves for the weekend. We would usually bust our asses all day Saturday to get all the actual work out of the way, so that we could spend the night partying and just sleep most of Sunday. There's one changeover weekend though, that none of us will ever forget. It started out normally. All the kids loaded onto the buses, the cabins were checked and cleaned, while I took the gator and a trailer into the woods to collect more firewood, just like we had done hundreds of times before. When I returned from my expedition, I grabbed an axe from the barn and began splitting the logs I had cut up with a chainsaw when one of the other staff members came on the radio Hey, did anyone else hear that noise out in the lake? She asked. I admitted that I hadn't, but judging by the responses of the rest of the staff, they had all heard it. I figured it was just a moose calling across the lake, and I didn't hear it because the barn was further back than all of the other buildings. I continued chopping and stacking firewood in the back of the barn, and after I was done, I took my toolbox and got on one of the ATVs and drove down to the cabins. By this point, the other staff had finished cleaning, and all I really had to do was make a few minor repairs, and we would be done for the night. At dinner that night, all anyone could talk about was the mysterious noise out in the lake. They described it as sounding like a very distorted elephant call. We all sort of laughed it off though, as the alcohol was starting to take effect, and no one really took it seriously. As the only sober one left, it was my responsibility to start the fire that night. I brought the gator down with a load of wood in the dump box and began to light the fire while everyone else cleaned up from dinner inside. Slowly the other staff finished up and began to trickle out to join me at the fire pit. It was a full moon and the fire pit was right next to the lake so you could see all the way across. The lake almost seemed to glow in the moonlight, and the twinkle of the lights from the cottages on the other side made the whole scene quite magical. Everyone sat around the fire drinking and laughing, telling stories of who their favorite kid was, or which kid they hated the most. Basically talking about exactly what you would expect camp counselors to talk about when not on duty. Later that night, one of the girls brought out her guitar and sang for us while the impromptu couples of the night cuddled around the fire. I, of course, always seemed to be left out of the hookup culture around the camp. Maybe it was because of my role that they saw me as more of a senior staff member. I don't know. Either way, none of the girls ever wanted to hook up with me. As a result of not being otherwise engaged in romance as the music played, I gazed out across the lake. I could see the navigation lights of a small boat coming towards us from across the lake, and as it drew closer I could hear the engines and it sounded like it was going at full throttle. I ignored it for a while, since it was possible to drive into town by boat through here, so seeing a boat late at night wasn't out of the ordinary. 
What was out of the ordinary was when the boat got closer to shore and didn't seem to show any signs of slowing down. I pointed this out to one of the guys sitting next to me, and he stood up to look. A few others joined him, and even the girl playing guitar stopped and turned around. With the music stopped, we could all hear the boat engine running at full RPM as it headed for shore. There was a loud crack as the boat hit the dock of a neighboring cottage, which deflected it back towards us, where it missed the beach entirely, and ran up onto the rocks a little ways down the shore and out of sight from us. The engines sounded awful as they were now out of the water and sucking air, but they didn't turn off or even idle down. Because of this, I immediately assumed the driver had to be unconscious, and I grabbed a first aid kit out of the main cabin, as well as the keys for the Boston Whaler, and ran down to our dock. A few of the other staff who were relatively sober came with me as we cast off and drove a little ways down to the shoreline to the runaway boat. When we got there, one of the other staff jumped on board and immediately shut the engine down. Using the searchlight on our boat, we could now get a good look at this mystery boat. It was an older Sea Ray bow rider, and it looked pretty thrashed. The windshield on the driver's side had been smashed and the back of the driver's seat had been ripped off and was laying on the floor near the back of the boat. There also seemed to be blood splatters toward the rear of the boat and over the top of the engine compartment. The most disturbing part, though, was that no one was on board. From the evidence that we had seen, it appeared as though the driver had been ripped out of the boat by something while driving at full speed. We called 911 and when the police arrived, they determined that the boat should still float, and we helped them to tow it over to our dock, where they could get a better look at it. They figured some cottager had been driving recklessly out on the lake, and had been thrown from the boat, and we all agreed that that seemed like the most logical explanation. A search was put out for a missing person on the lake that night, and within an hour, a helicopter was hovering over the lake, scanning it with a searchlight. The next day the police were able to track down the owner of the boat who came to inspect it. Him and his whole family were accounted for, so none of them had been the person driving the boat the previous night. Someone had stolen this poor man's boat, and had been ripped out of it while trying to get away. That's when I remembered the distorted elephant noise the other staff had been talking about. The damage to the boat did look an awful lot like some large creature had taken a swipe at the boat and ripped the driver right out. I of course kept my thoughts to myself as I didn't want to look stupid, but later that night, after the police had the boat hauled away, another one of the staff mentioned the same theory, that whatever had made that noise had attacked that stolen boat and killed the driver. Or maybe the driver was trying to get away from the creature and had stolen the boat as a means of escape. We all talked about the incident for weeks after that speculating on what happened. Given the circumstances and local legends, our running theory is that some unfortunate soul ran across a wendigo in the woods and in their attempt to escape had found this boat with the keys in it, but was ripped from the boat as they were taking off from the dock, leaving the boat to continue on with no driver as the person was devoured. Of course, something else more realistic could have happened. Disturbs me to this day. Winter is long and cold up here, but fun nonetheless. As a child, I would stay outside all day playing in the snow and then have to soak my hands in warm water for 10 minutes just to get the feeling back in them. Those were the best times of my life. However, the winter I was in fifth grade, something horrible would be set in motion in my town. School had just let out for Christmas break when the first body was found. His name was Mike Keller, and he was a second grader from Mount Vernon. The reports on the news said he had been beaten severely but he also had multiple stab wounds that were determined to be the cause of death. 
I can't say that the murder caused an uproar. That would come later, but it certainly got folks' attention. It didn't put a dent in my thick head. If my mom mentioned it to me, I don't recall it. My usual life continued unabated. Day after day, I would spend my time playing in the snow, only taking breaks to eat and play Minecraft. Things didn't really ramp up until another kid was found. This one turned out to be from my neck of the woods. The police reports echoed that of the previous murder. Although, the stab wounds were far more numerous than on the body of Keller. Now was when the parents, county-wide, started taking the threat more seriously. I'm sure every kid got the same speech as I did. Warning of the dangers of talking to people that you didn't know. When everyone would discover the truth behind the murders, it would be much more horrible than they expected. If any kid paid attention to their parents' warnings, I wasn't one of them. My mom's words went in one ear and out the other. Since the snow had long melted after Christmas Day, I made plans to meet up with my friends at our hand-built fort in the woods. But when I got there, the only people around were two kids I didn't know very well. One was a seventh grader, and the other was a year behind me. He went to the same school as I did, and the rumor was that he had been held back twice. From the looks of him, the rumors were true. Despite only being slightly taller than me, he was already showing signs of a mustache. When it comes to the older kid, I didn't know much about him other than he had a reputation for being mean to younger kids. So the second I saw him, I got very nervous. The two of them, whose names I'm not going to mention here for the reason you will soon see, were acting like they were my best friends, despite never talking to me before. When the older boy asked me if my friends were on their way, I foolishly told the truth. If they weren't already at the fort, they probably wouldn't be coming. This must have been the answer they were hoping for, because as soon as I said it, they began their attack. The older boy sucker punched me to the ground. I came very close to passing out. Now I know if I had, I would have been number three on their hit list. But somehow, I stayed awake. I used a nearby tree to get to my feet just in time to see the younger kid pull a folding knife from his pocket. The older kid was swinging a wooden bat around. When they saw me stand up, the older boy ran up to me and swung for my head. I ducked, but he was close enough to rip a lock of hair out when the bat hit the tree above me. I figured the kid with the knife was coming after me next, so I booked it out of there. My legs were still a little rubbery, but I knew if I stopped, I was dead. The older kid was right on my heels, and my lungs were burning terribly. However, I was fortunate to live on the edge of the woods and made it inside my house before they caught up with me. I ran into my mom, and I breathlessly tried to explain what had just happened. She understood enough to be upset and yelled for my dad to call the police. My mom quickly explained the situation to him, and he related to the dispatcher. The police came quick, and I told them what had happened and who did it. They had no problem finding the boys. They must have known it was over for them, and they both went home and waited. The brutality of the murders was taken into consideration, and it was decided to keep them in custody until their trials. Naturally, the DA wanted to try them as adults, but they were just a bit too young. Since each boy was blaming the other, despite both of them being responsible, they were tried separately. Neither showed any remorse and as a result they were given life for each murder and 15 to 25 for the attempt on my life. Had this happened just a few years earlier, they both would have likely been given life without parole for each murder charge. But recent legislation states that an offender cannot be given such a sentence if they committed their crime as a youthful offender. Ultimately, the legislation mattered not. Both boys were transferred to the adult system at 21, and because of crimes they committed inside, they probably won't ever get out. 
and that's the way I like it. It was glaringly obvious to everyone around at the time that they weren't right in the head. It's just terrible that two young boys, and almost myself, had to lose their lives before something was done about them. I was just a kid of about 15 or 16 when this happened. This was in the days when just about every kid in school, or around the neighborhood, had some type of part-time job. It was just a given that once you were old enough to push a lawnmower, shovel a driveway, or rake leaves, you spent a portion of your day working for your own money. As this was decades before the invention of the internet, having a job was something kids just accepted and some jumped into it with relish. It was a great excuse to get out of the house and make a little pocket money in the process. My first part-time job was typical for that era. I had a newspaper route. That will tell you how long ago it was. I'm in my late 40s now, but can still remember riding my bicycle to the corner to collect the bundle of papers that had been dropped there counting them out to make sure I hadn't been shorted, insert whatever flyers or ads were included for that day, and pedaling door to door for blocks to deliver them. Right here I can tell you that all of the old movie stuff you see of the kid on his bike zipping merrily down the street, chucking newspapers blindly in the direction of homes as he passes, is complete bullshit. If a kid back then went meandering around the neighborhood flinging newspapers from his bag all willy-nilly, he'd get his ass fired in a hurry. It was kind of a big deal to be a good paper boy. You knew not to ride on the grass, let your bike drop onto anyone's bushes after hopping off, and to keep clear of the flower beds. This was the suburbs where practically everyone obsessed over how nice their yard looked. So, the better you treated your customers, and their yards, the better the tips were when you collected the money each month, and some, even bigger ones, come Christmas. They even had trophies for the best paper boy in the county. I even won a trophy once. The thing was two feet tall, made of fake gold and marble, with a figurine of a paper boy on top, delivery bag and all holding a rolled newspaper raised to the sky. This shit was taken seriously. Monday through Friday the papers were delivered in the afternoon. Saturday and Sunday were the only days back then that the newspaper was delivered in the morning. When I figured out that the bundles were usually dropped as early as 5 a.m., that's when I'd get up to start my route. It wasn't that I was gunning for another trophy, it's just that if you got up that early, it'd still be dark by the time you came home. Then, you could just crash back into bed and wake up at your leisure to a free Saturday or Sunday, as you'd never had to get up in the first place. Paperboy logic. This took place on a Sunday. The Sunday papers sucked to the extent that they were the thickest and required the most inserts, including the comic section, which was still called the funnies. So I often had to take two trips, leaving half of my bundle by the street post on the corner to deliver the first part for the route and then go back for the rest. It could be a pain in the ass, but it was better than getting a hernia dragging a two-ton newspaper bag along behind you. The first half of my route was almost entirely apartments. That made for quick deliveries. I could zip into these small two-story apartment buildings set the paper down in front of each door, and zip right back out. Eight deliveries in less than a minute. The second half of my route had houses spread out and around the then sparsely developed area. Right in the middle of my route was what we called the horseshoe. It was a dirt road that formed a U-shape, with the upper prongs connecting to the main road. You'd go down the horseshoe on one side to curve around, and go up the other side when on my route. There were only five houses spread along the horseshoe, with large gaps between them. There was maybe one or two streetlights along the way, 
mostly obscured by the branches of overhanging trees, so it was usually pretty dark. If you didn't know the way by heart, you'd be riding into the grove of trees or roll right into a ditch. That was the main reason that I loved nights with a full moon. The light of the moon shone down on the houses along this dirt road, making it easier to see. Sometimes it wouldn't even seem like it was still nighttime if the moon was really bright and there wasn't any cloud cover. In the winter, with all the fresh snow everywhere, a full moon meant a very well-lit route. What follows is the one time I wasn't all that crazy about there being a full moon. Dead center of the horseshoe's curve was a single house perched on a small hill. It was a nice two-story house with flowers running the length of the porch, a bench swing at one end near the front door, a two-car garage, the works. Ideal suburbia. The only thing about this house was that it had the steepest driveway in the neighborhood. So getting up the darn thing was a chore, even if you had good momentum on your bike starting out. Once to the top of Mount Driveway, I would just roll up the paper, slide it into the mail slot in the side door by the garage, give it a quick tap to send it inside, and then turn around and enjoy a fast glide down the driveway, at top speed, even without pedaling. It didn't go quite like that this time, as there was a full moon that night. It was pretty bright, even for five in the morning. Lots of houses were painted white or light colors, so they reflected the moonlight well. There was also no wind, which was a huge plus. No worry about the wind yanking the paper out of your hand before you could get it rolled up, and no fighting against the wind either going through your route, or coming home. When I rounded the curve at the end of the horseshoe, I was making good time. Even with the Sunday supplement doing its best to weigh me down, I had already delivered the first half of the route and was looking forward to finishing quick so I could return home to bed. I pedaled up the steep driveway, only having to stop once to push myself along with my sneakers. I dropped the kickstand and dismounted, already digging into my bag for a paper. At the top of the driveway, the whole front of the house practically glowed in the moonlight. Bright white paint, red shutters, all those flowers. It looked kind of pretty. That's when I heard the creak. I stopped, not certain what I had heard. It was definitely metal, like the hinges on a gate being opened. But there were no gates nearby that I knew of, and none of the houses on the horseshoe had fenced in yards. Then, I heard the creak again, which rose in pitch to a squeak. This time, I recognized the sound immediately. It was the sound of a swing moving. I had been to every playground in town growing up, so I knew the sound that chains make when you use the swing. There was a kid's playground not far from where I was, but I doubted I could hear one of the swings from that distance. Besides, a quick glance confirmed that the playground was deserted, as it would be at five in the morning. The moonlight made that view clear. Then I heard the squeak again, lasting a bit longer. The hair stood up on the back of my neck as I realized that the sound was close. I looked back to the house and saw the bench swing at the end of the porch, suspended from two chains. It was rocking back and forth. There was no wind to push it, and there would have to be quite a gust to budge something that heavy anyway. Then, the swing picked up speed, as if someone on it was pumping their legs to get it going. My heart started pounding like crazy. There was nobody on the swing. Not a soul. It was empty, and there was no place to hide beneath it where someone could reach up to push it, as a prank. The swing was just swinging back and forth on its own. I was completely terrified, but couldn't look away. What the hell was I seeing? There in the light of the full moon, an empty bench swing 
was rocking higher and higher, back and forth, with nobody sitting in it. That's when I heard it. A giggle. I heard the giggle of a little girl, perhaps four or five years old at the oldest. My jaw dropped open, and I was physically shaking. Let me emphasize that there was nothing sinister about this giggle at all. This wasn't a menacing laugh or a piercing cackle. This was the mischievous, tittering giggle of a very young girl at play. It was coming right from the empty bench swing. I couldn't breathe. I had never felt so frightened in my life. Anybody else at that point would have just run, or ridden away on their bike, pedaling as fast as they could go. But no. I was a good paper boy, and I had the trophy to prove it. Acting solely on reflex, for want of another way to explain it, I yanked one of the bulky Sunday papers from my bag and fumbled with it, trying desperately to roll it. I needed to get rid of that damn thing as fast as I could, so I could get out of there. The dead air just above the swing let out what sounded like a short chuckle, as if whatever was laughing had tried to cover its mouth. The swing kept swinging. It was gibbering like some kind of lunatic as I fought with the paper. Fold, damn it, fold! Why won't you fold over? I eventually turned with the half-rolled newspaper to push it through the mail slot. It wouldn't fit. It was way too thick. Why did the damned Sunday papers have to be so huge? I pushed, pulled back, and pushed again, doing little more than shredding the front page with failed attempt after failed attempt. Frantically, I kept glancing back at the swing to see if anyone was there. But there was no one. Just the empty swing, still rocking steadily. I gave up and just rammed the stupid paper into the slot as hard as I could. Squashed into a rumpled mess, half in and half out of the slot, I abandoned the newspaper and scrambled for my bike. I couldn't even get on it. I was shaking so badly and freaking out so much that it was like I had forgotten how to ride a bike. I ran like hell down that steep driveway, dragging the bike behind me by one of the handlebars. Once I reached the dirt road, I finally was able to get onto my bike, but it felt like something had grabbed it, holding it back. I looked down to see the kickstand was still down, digging a thin rut into the dirt beside me. I smashed the thing back with my heel and pedaled for all I was worth. There wasn't another sound of giggling, but the swing rocked a little higher, as if my terror was providing great amusement for whatever sat there. I could still hear the chains on the swing squeak as I took off. At the next house, I didn't give a tinker's damn about paperboy delivery protocol. I just chucked the fat Sunday edition at the door by their garage and was already zooming off before the thing hit the ground. Same for the next house. And the next one. Just like in the movies, right? I think by the time I completed my route that morning, I may have gone back to delivering the newspapers properly. I don't remember now. I didn't remember then. All I could remember was that empty bench swing and that disembodied giggle. When I got home, I did fall back into bed, but I didn't go to sleep. I just stared at the ceiling and felt readily scared until the sun came up. The following week, it was business as usual. Afternoon deliveries same as normal, and come the weekend, I made sure there were fresh batteries in my Walkman so that I could drown out any unearthly giggling with the songs of Kenny Loggins or Michael Jackson. I never did hear the giggle again, not that I wanted to. The swing only ever rocked when a person was in it, or when we were in the midst of a January blizzard. Even then, it only moved a little under the pounding wind. Like I said, it was heavy. Nothing else creepy or unusual ever happened on my paper route again. Even with what had happened, I realized it could have been worse. I mean, 
That giggle wasn't followed by any sudden footsteps as an invisible ghost child leapt off the swing to come running after me. That would have made for one hell of a story, but most likely one that ended with me suffering heart failure or winding up in a mental institution. To this day I have no explanation for that giggle. Some say I was being pranked. Others tell me it was a spirit or a sprite of some kind. All I can tell you is, I know what it's like to be scared by a prank or unnerved by a ghost story. Later in life, I even had a panic attack a few times. So I know what it's like to feel scared. But nothing, ever, has left me as scared as I was that Sunday morning, under the full moon, when I heard that giggle. A few years back, my friends and I decided to see the country. We had grown up around Sacramento area, and as much as we loved our native Cali, we knew damn well that the Lower West Coast is hardly a decent representation of the United States. Apparently there's a huge stretch of land between the coasts called America, or at least that's what some would have you believe. But either way, I didn't want to go off to college and into full-time work without having a story or two to tell my dorm mates. So cut to about three days into the journey, and we're on our way to our first real stop in Boise, Idaho. My buddies hooked his iPhone up to the minivan speakers via an auxiliary cable, and is in the process of playing every single road trip related song he can possibly find. It might have been annoying if his music taste wasn't so damn good. Keep your eyes on the road, and your hands upon the wheel, we all roared along with Jim Morrison, Roadhouse Blues blasting so loud I could barely hear the van's engine. It was so much fun. We dreamed up the ultimate road trip, and now we were actually living it. Didn't even need a beer to feel the buzz of it. Just a few miles outside of town, we see someone standing by the side of the road in the distance. It's important to remember the frame of mind we're in romanticizing the road. I mean, I would never normally stop to pick up a hitchhiker. I've watched way too many horror films. But since there were four of us packed into that van, a kind of collective bravado had taken us over. So as we pass the dude, and see that he actually has his thumb out, we collectively flip. I stop the van in the middle of the road, and slowly start reversing up towards where this guy stood. Hey, do you need a ride, dude? He instantly looked elated. He obviously had no luck for a good few hours, and a van full of teenagers was like a godsend to him. I could kind of see why people might pass him. He looked a little rough with this weird kind of young, old vibe going on. Like his clothes were fairly modern, but his skin was leathery as hell. Like he had spent all day, every day, underneath Utah or Nevada's sun. Are y'all going to Boise? He asked in a gravely voice. Sure are, dude. Hop in. So the guy tells us his name is Jimmy, and that he's actually from Idaho originally, but has spent a lot of time out of state for work. We ask him what he does for a living, and he gave us some half-assed answer about being a contractor. He said his last job was really constrictive, and he was real happy to get away from it and was just heading back into Boise to see some old friends. He starts telling us stories from his time on the road, and it sounded like he was something of a wild child in the early 80s. How he went to California looking for work, and ended up getting in a few scrapes with the law. At one point, one of my buddies asks Jimmy if he spent any time inside. I really don't know what he expected the answer to be, but all of a sudden, Jimmy's tone changes completely as he shoots my friend a daggered look. No, and I don't ever intend to, he replied contemptuously. The atmosphere in the van shifted. It was super awkward for a few miles, but the conversation soon returned to normal with us swapping stories and sharing laughs. After about an hour or so of continuous driving, we're getting closer and closer to Boise. 
but it was around then that we hit our first serious speed bump. I look in the rear view mirror and see an Idaho State Police cruiser. As it's speeding up behind us, I move over a little to let it pass. Only it doesn't. Then, Jimmy saw the cop car and ducks down in the back seat. We start laughing and joking about him being a fugitive or something. Only he didn't join in the laughter. He just stayed down in the seat and didn't make a sound. As soon as the cop car's lights turned on and the siren blared across the highway, I knew what was about to happen. It was like I could see the whole thing pan out in my head in slow motion, and I was powerless to do anything to stop it. It was far too late for that. I actually start slowing down to pull over, purely wishful thinking on my part. I expected to hear Jimmy say something, and I was right. Only it wasn't him that spoke first. What the hell? You have a gun? One of my buddies cries. You keep this thing moving. Don't stop for nothing. I hear him cock the hammer on his weapon. I didn't even turn around to see what it was. You slow this van down, and I'm going to kill every single one of you. Do you understand? I've never been so scared in my entire life. I could hear the cop shouting over the loudspeaker. Driver, pull the vehicle over to the side of the road right now. But I couldn't. We were trapped. It was only about then that I checked the fuel gauge out of habit. It turned out to be a godsend. In our foolish revelry, we had passed numerous gas stations we really should have stopped at to refuel. Now we only had a few miles worth of gas. All we'd have to do was wait for it to run out. I remember feigning a kind of solidarity with the guy, assuring him that I wouldn't pull over until we passed state lines on the other side of Boise. My buddies must have thought I was nuts. They didn't know that all we had to do was run out the clock. Crap, we're running out of gas. I'm sorry dude, but I'm gonna have to pull over. Your best chance is to jump out and run. Run like hell and never look back. Jimmy ate it up. It was an Oscar winning performance if I do say so myself. He actually patted me on the shoulder as I slowed the van down and edged over to the roadside. You're a good kid. You'll do all right, he said. I remember his breath smelling rotten. When I finally pull the car over, one of my buddies slides the van door open and Jimmy just hauls ass into the trees. One of the cops jumps out, securing us in the van, while his partner got this big dog from the backseat of their cruiser and chased Jimmy into the woods. We were there for an hour or two while the cops searched our van, but we didn't have anything illegal on us. Thank God we had finished all the beer we had managed to wrangle the night before, or we might have actually had something to worry about. Once it was established that the guy was basically holding us hostage, they let us go, and one of the cops actually tells me that I did the right thing. They didn't catch him, and as far as I know, they never have. But whatever the case, I know Jimmy can't have been the dude's real name. No one was hurt, nothing was damaged, but still, I have zero intention of ever picking up a hitchhiker ever again. Me and my friends are grunge freaks. We started out on Nirvana and Soundgarden, eventually discovering more obscure bands like Mud Honey and Melvin's and the Screaming Trees. Anyone who knows anything about grunge will tell you that it all started in Seattle. How this spontaneous new genre sprang out of the ashes of post-punk to take the world by storm, and it all happened within like a few square miles. So naturally, Seattle is like a mecca for grunge fans, and after years of planning and false commitment, we finally got our crap together and went on a road trip to our sacred city. That's how we ended up on the Wyoming Interstate. 
So we're just driving along, singing along to Alice in Chains songs, when the next thing I know, I can see red and blue flashes in my rear view mirror. My buddies in the back seat spin around, seeing the same thing that I did. An unmarked vehicle with one of those attachable emergency lights on the top. As I start to pull over, I'm wondering where in the hell this cop car came from. We were on this long stretch of open road and could see for miles around us. It was pretty unnerving that it had managed to creep up on us like that. But you know how it is. Traffic cops tend to stay out of sight in little rest areas or whatever. Their speedometer is at the ready. Now I was well within the speed limit, but I was still worried. I'd be lying if I said we didn't have anything on us that we shouldn't have, but that was all buried in our bags in the trunk, and even then, it wasn't exactly enough to charge us with, so I just got my driver's license ready on my lap and kept my hands at 10 and 2 like a good little citizen. The cop turns off his lights and then gets out of the unmarked car, walking along the dusty roadside towards us. He's wearing civilian clothes, a baseball cap, aviator sunglasses, and a checkered shirt. But I can clearly see the utility belt and badge that he's wearing. When he knocks on my window, I promptly roll it down, smiling, while I give him my cheeriest, Good afternoon, officer. I'm no bootlicker, but I'm not giving this guy an excuse to ruin our road trip. What follows probably isn't exactly what was said that day, but it's as best as I can remember. Afternoon, officer. How can I help you? Driver's license and registration. He demands curtly. Sure thing. I take one hand off the steering wheel and hand him my license. He takes a long, careful look first at my license, and then at me. Detroit, huh? He finally said dismissively, You're a long way from home, son. What's your business in Wyoming? Uh, we're actually on a road trip, sir. Headed out towards Washington, Seattle to be specific. What for? Uh, just because, I guess. Always wanted to see the West Coast. Just because? The cop mockingly interjected. Maybe see some of California? My words broke off. I really didn't like where the whole thing was going. Any weapons in the car? No, sir. Drugs or alcohol? No, sir. I replied without hesitation, but the answer didn't satisfy him. I could feel his steely gaze from behind his mirrored sunglasses. They made him seem like more of a machine than a man. I'm gonna need y'all to step out of the vehicle. His voice was cold. What? What? What for? Don't make me tell you again, son. I turned to my buddies in the back seat, and they looked as worried as I felt. Slowly. We did as we were told and got out of my car, walking over to the side of the road and grouping together near the verge. It was then that I actually got a good look at the unmarked car that the cop was driving. It was an old Dodge pickup. I mean really old. It looked like it might fall apart if the thing drove faster than 40. Something interest you about my vehicle, son? Uh, no sir. I lied thinking that their department must have been seriously underfunded. Then eyes front. One of my buddies shot me a look as if to say, what the hell is this guy's deal? But I just shook my head, figuring if we just play along, we might get out of there faster. I'm gonna need to see the passenger's IDs too, the cop said suddenly. Mine's in the car, one friend said. The other said the same. You didn't take your IDs out to show a cop at a goddamn traffic stop? Are you mentally disabled? I, uh, no. Then go get him. Then, to my complete shock, the cop takes his revolver out from his hip holster and points it at one of my buddies. One of my friends turn 
looks down at the barrel of the revolver and freezes in place, pure fear in his eyes. I'm not going to shoot you, but I need to cover my ass just in case you pull a gun out that back seat, the cop said with a grin. Now go on. Go get him. It was about this point that I decided to make a formal complaint against the cop. I was scared, sure, but I was really pissed off, too. Whatever backwater county this was, their volunteer sheriff program obviously needed some thorough vetting. I didn't know how much good it would do, but I had to do something. This asshole had to pay. After he gets my buddy's IDs, he takes them back to his truck and starts writing stuff down on a notepad, obviously all of our personal information. Then he starts talking to someone, but not on a radio as you expect. All he had was a cell phone in his hand. When he finishes, he gets out and then doesn't even walk all the way over to us before just tossing our IDs into the dirt. Get the hell out of Wyoming, he spat before getting back into his truck and speeding off into the distance, leaving us choking on a cloud of dirt. Once he's out of sight, we start cursing him out, raging about how we're going to make a formal complaint once we're back home from our trip. So cut to about an hour later, and we're only about 50 miles further into our journey, when another set of red and blue lights appears in my rearview mirror. We just straight up panic at this point, and actually debate whether or not to just try to outrun this psycho, since there's no way his old truck could keep up with us. But once we work out that it's an actual marked unit this time, and evidently not the same asshole, we pull over and repeat the entire goddamn process. Only, it doesn't go quite the same way. I'll just tell you what you need to know. At some point, I mentioned to this uniformed cop that I've already been stopped, like just an hour before. He looks confused and asks where we had been pulled over. I didn't know any place names by heart, but I insisted it was less than a hundred miles back the way we just came. When the uniformed cop tells us that this is impossible, it takes all my will not to ask this guy if all Wyoming cops are as incompetent as this. But then he finishes his sentence. I'm the only highway patrol in this county right now. If it wasn't me who pulled you over, I really don't know who did. We described the guy who pulled us over to the uniformed cop told him the vehicle type, even the color of this asshole's mustache, but the cop has no clue who we were talking about. Then it hit us. The guy wasn't highway patrol. He wasn't even a volunteer deputy. To this very day, we have no idea who it was that pulled us over on that stretch of interstate. Our complaints to the state police went nowhere, as far as I know. They never found the guy to charge him with impersonating an officer. The lesson being, even though it might piss them off, always ask for ID from cops who pull you over, and be sure to take a damned good look at it too. There are some real psychos out there. So, I grew up in Las Vegas. I'd moved there when I was in second grade. I was around seven or so, and my mother was working at some sort of motorcycle repair shop in Arizona that just wasn't paying the bills at all. So, she jumped at the offer of a new job. Fast forward about five years, I'm in middle school, and my brother and I were almost exactly two years apart. I was about to turn 12, so he was around 10 at the time. My mother, being quite low on the seniority list, was forced to work late nights. That left me and my brother home alone after school more often than not. Our nights were usually pretty uneventful, 
usually consisted of us avoiding whatever homework we were assigned, warming up leftovers in the microwave, and watching whatever sparked our interest on TV, which was either WWE wrestling or some kind of cartoon. We usually ended up in bed before our mum got home, but occasionally we'd wait up for her. One night, or I suppose one afternoon considering it was still light, everything was pretty normal. My brother sat on the living room floor, engulfed in whatever was on the TV, and I was using my mother's desktop computer, levelling up my character on RuneScape. Then there was a rather aggressive knock at the door, which was very odd. I was sort of an outcast child. I didn't have too many friends, nor did my brother. Not only that, we lived in what you would consider a senior living community. My mother was the youngest adult there, and was around her mid-thirties. My brother, being too short to reach the peephole, doesn't move, only slightly reacts and looks at me. I get up off the computer chair and make my way to the front door to glance out the peephole. I see a man in a black ski mask staring at me through the peephole. It definitely didn't seem real. It sort of seemed like something from a cliche movie, as if he were dressed to rob a bank. I was immediately scared shitless and I obviously didn't bother asking who it was. I silently stepped away, shut off the TV, grabbed my brother on our small black pomenarian and ran towards my bedroom. Once we were safely hidden in my closet, I informed him of what I saw outside. He didn't say much, but was visibly shaken and just quietly stood there holding our little dog. I slid the tiny flip phone our mum lent us for emergencies from my pocket and dialed 911. I whispered to the operator the entirety of the call, and I didn't think the man had left considering the knocks persisted after we left the living room. Yet somehow, she understood me and sent an officer over. Immediately after the call ended with the operator, I dialed for our mother. I explained everything to her, and she ended up leaving work early, and came home around the time that the police had as well. I'm not sure what deterred him of pursuing further, but of course, the man was gone by the time they both had arrived. The officer was very clearly not taking any of it seriously, most likely thinking that these two young boys were just paranoid from staying home alone. It was probably just a young man playing a joke on a friend, they thought. However, like I stated before, we live in a senior living community. Who could he be possibly playing a joke on? His dear grandmother? He then gave my brother and I stickers, as if that would console our nerves after seeing some masked man pounding on our door. Fortunately, I never saw the stranger after that. However, after the experience, my house did get broken into, as well as my car three times. Thankfully, none of us were present when any of this took place, since my family and I moved out of the state and installed a security system. Nevertheless, I hope we never meet again. Varmic control for ranchers with free range cattle about two hours south of Tuscan, in the Sky Island. I arrived and parked my vehicle at the mouth of a small canyon and set up a shelter about 10 feet away. Approximately one hour before sunset, I made dinner and chatted on CB with other hunters and set up my area. At the time, I heard noises from the canyon at the mouth you could see 15 feet in, and then it took a sharp right. The walls were about 12 feet high, but I heard the noise, and it sounded like it came from way deeper in the canyon. It was a repetitive clacking noise, like someone had two sticks 
and kept hitting them together. They did not stop. At least I fell asleep to the noise, with my rifle at my side. I woke up at 4am sharp, had some breakfast and got ready to head out. I locked my truck and clubbed the steering wheel and was off. I walked about three miles from the mountain, found a high hill and it was covered in white quartz rock. It had massive veins of mica and was definitely a sight to behold. By the time I arrived to the hill, the sun was up and the coyotes were yapping. I called and called and laid there motionless for two hours. Nothing. I watched a small bug crawl on my scope and fly away. And that's when I noticed movement about 270 yards away. It was a single coyote. Diseased. I zeroed in on it and noticed its funny walk. It walked leading with its right shoulder and its head bobbed up and down a little bit too much. I figured I'd put the poor thing out of its misery. I took aim and squeezed. It connected and it went down. I walked to collect the animal and I walked to the spot and I didn't see it. I swear that's where it fell. Three yards from the sideways barrel cactus. I saw no blood and no trail, just silence. I knew I watched it go down. I saw it. I searched for 30 minutes and saw nothing that led me to the animal. Well, there just went my $40. I called it a day and was getting a little warm and my arms were sore from the rifle. So I hoofed it back, slowly, in case I ran into the bed of my truck. I was set facing into the moor of the canyon, dead centre of the entrance, in the shade of the wall, and that's when I heard it again, the clacking. This time it sounded closer, as if it were right behind the bend of the canyon, as if whatever it was doing was hiding right behind the turn. I didn't dare grab my chair. It was ten dollars at the swap and meet and I thought about firing around into the canyon, but figured that it wouldn't do much. I rolled up my tent, keeping a sharp eye on the canyon, and at this point the clacking would stop, each time I stopped what I was doing to watch and listen. When I would go back to loading my truck, it would start right back up. I packed my tent, tossed it in the bed, grabbed my lantern and my propane stove, and put them in the bed as well. I put my rifle away, and I still had my 1911 at my hip, but I didn't feel safe. I jumped in my truck and started it. I watched the canyon. Nothing. Not a sound. Just the low rumble from the cold started truck. I let her run a bit and warm up. At this time the canyon was filled with sunlight as it was noonish, and I felt a sense of bravery, and I wanted to take a quick peep around the bend of the canyon. So I let my truck run, grabbed my pistol, and I approached the canyon. I stood at the mouth, listening for any shuffling, clacking. But there was nothing. It was bright from the sun, and I led with my gun. I stood about five feet away from the bend, unsure what was waiting on the other side. I thought to myself to just grab the chair and book it, but I needed to know. I leaned in slowly around the corner and saw nothing. It went about 20 feet in and then a dead end. I did notice animal tracks, hoof marks and coyote tracks. I didn't notice any animals during my stay and these prints looked fresh. I stood at the corner facing down at the dead end Two very smooth rocks lay at my feet. They did not look of the region. They were light red, smooth, as if they were from the rivers. I turned away, grabbed my chair and drove off. I felt as though I was being watched. I swear there were eyes on me, and they knew that I knew. I felt like a game, like they were the mouse and I was the cat. However, I wouldn't chase. Now I've encountered relics of Native American tribes in the area, 
Old clay pots, napped tools, smooth stones to grind grain on. But I had thought the tribes were long gone. I spoke to a good friend, a fellow called Hugh. His last name was Huerta. He came from the lines of tribe members. His mother and his grandparents a 100% Pascua blood. His father was mixed thick, and he spoke of the medicine men that would curse animals and was said to be shapeshifters, evil beings that were turned the wrong way from the magic. He said what I had experienced was from one of the spirits playing games to get me away from their lands. He said he'll have his buelo pray for me and that I should stay the night at his parents' house and was blessed so that I would be safe. And so I did. My friend and I planned a day to go to Disneyland. It was originally going to be four of us, but my friend who was driving wanted someone else to tag along. The girl that was coming was the 16-year-old daughter of some lady that went to my friend's church. And during this time, I am 18. We pick her up at our house, and she's a kind of small petite girl, and she just sits in the back of the car, in between me and our other friend. I notice almost instantly that she is very timid and soft-spoken. I thought she might be shy, and right away she starts talking to me, just me. Even though she knew everyone else in the car. This is the second time I met her. The first time I was at my friend's graduation party a month before, but I only said a few words to her at the time. The first thing this girl says to me is that she has cancer. I got really sad and thought maybe this is why she looked kind of frail. She went on about how she's staying in a local hospital half the time and her doctors are really nice. I didn't even ask what type of cancer she had. I was just concerned about making that day fun for her. But then she started talking about how her uncle raped her. By then, I'm thinking this girl has gone through a lot. But I was wondering why she was telling me all of this when she doesn't even know me. We get to Disneyland, and we wait in line for the first ride. She starts telling us that the chemo and radiation is kicking in. I see her walk behind a tree, and stick her finger in her mouth, and force herself to throw up. By now I'm thinking that something's up, and I ask my friends some questions. They tell me that she is a pathological liar. Okay. That would have been nice to tell me beforehand. Throughout the day, the girl was constantly trying to sit next to me on every ride that we went on, talking about her cancer and how she wants me to be there for her. She even pointed out a random stranger in the crowd and said that that was her uncle and she hugged me to protect herself. A few hours later, she did the exact same thing and points to a completely different guy. We use the rest stop, and when I'm done I realize everyone else is still in the restroom, except for her. She starts telling me that ever since the first time she met me, she knew that I was the one. She said that she felt this special connection to me, and that I was her knight in shining armor. It really freaked me out. Later on, my friends tell me that the girl actually has a boyfriend. I couldn't believe it, but sure enough, I go on Facebook and see pictures of them together, and it says that she's in a relationship. What? Why is this girl saying all of these things to me while she has a boyfriend? I was getting quite creeped out by this point, and I wanted to leave. But more than anything, I wanted to catch her in her lie. I asked her why she still has hair if she's supposedly been going through this chemo and radiation. She turns around, and I shit you not, 
she pulls out a chunk of her hair from her scalp and says, See? I'm losing hair as we speak. This girl has issues. I ask her why she's flirting with me if she has a boyfriend and told to her that she was wrong. She immediately said that she was going to break up with him and handed me the ring he gave her and told me to have it. On the way home, she opened my hand and handed me a thumbtack. I was thinking, what the hell? She said she wanted me to keep it because this is from her and that's the thumbtack that she uses to cut herself with. I did not want to be holding that thing. I just wanted to finally be home. On a side note, during the day we were talking about the colleges that we were going to in the fall, and I mentioned the one that I was going to go to. This girl said that she would be going there when she goes to college. I thought she was lying again, but I found out from my friend that her dad works at the college and that she gets free tuition there. So that happened to be true, but of course everything else was a lie. Two years later, I saw her at the school walking to class and tried to avoid her as much as I could. I did not want to go through all of that again. This happened when I was 16, visiting my grandma who lives in a small town in Poland. Just for context, it was summer and my family wasn't with me at the time. As you can imagine, living without my parents for a short time, as my grandma is really chill, was a dream. I could stay out late as often as I wanted, without my parents being able to prove it. Now at 16, you feel like you're invincible. You don't really think about how many messed up people there are in this world. Because of this mindset, I wasn't worried about walking home alone that night. The day on which this story takes place was very hot. I remember shopping and hanging out with my friends until about 8pm when it started to rain. Instead of walking home quickly, I decided to visit my aunt's house, hang out with my cousin for a bit and walk home when the rain stopped. Well, I lost track of time and ended up leaving her house at 10.30 p.m. At this point, the rain had almost completely subsided, and this being my favorite type of weather, I declined my aunt's kind offer to drive me back, telling her I was getting a cab. I'm still surprised she believed this, but maybe she just didn't care. So I went on my way called my grandma to tell her I'd be home in 30 minutes, but not telling her that I was walking alone. If there was one thing that scared me, it were the huge train tracks that you had to cross in order to get to my grandma's house the fastest. So I decided to take the longer way round through some sort of nature preserve. I enjoyed my walk through the light rain until the long metal bridge came into view. Just as it's beginning, I saw a man. It was a small, quiet town, so it wasn't common for the people here to be out this late. But I wasn't scared immediately. I only saw his back, but he looked like every other guy you'd pass on the street. He didn't seem to notice me, and I didn't really care. I got distracted by looking at the trees to my left, but when I came to the beginning of the bridge, the man was nowhere to be seen. I suddenly stopped dead in my tracks and got an ominous feeling. This man couldn't have already been out of my view. It would have been impossible for him to move this fast. He would have had to run, and I definitely would have heard him running on the metal bridge. At the end of the bridge, there was a small path that led under it, which was hidden by thick bushes. I got even more scared by the thought that he was hiding there, waiting for me. I slowly started to walk backwards, not taking my eyes off the bushes. I hid behind a tree, 
and decided to wait a few minutes to see if he was hiding there. After about 10 minutes, my biggest fear came true. Suddenly the man emerged from the bushes, looking in my direction. He was holding something big and shiny. In the dark, I still managed to make out that it was a knife. My mind started racing with a thousand questions. How did he see me? Why didn't I see the knife before? Where was he hiding it? He suddenly started to run in my direction. So fast. He ran straight past me, hiding behind this tree. And I was so relieved when he was out of sight. I ran faster than I ever ran, not stopping to look behind me. Being frightened the whole way back, thinking that he'd somehow find me and do whatever sick things he had in mind. Luckily, I arrived home safely, my grandma waiting for me, already mad. I decided not to tell her what happened, partially not to worry her, but also so she wouldn't tell my parents about our secret curfew. Looking back, this was one of the stupidest lies I've ever told because of what happened a month after this incident. Two teenage girls about my age were stabbed dozens of times by this bridge. One body was found 30 meters from it. The other one was thrown into the nearby river. To this day, Nobody knows who did it, but I'm pretty sure it was the same man I encountered. I was too scared to come out and tell anyone about what happened, but I can't help but feel that those two girls would have been alive today if it wasn't for my stupidity. I'm not a particularly good looking guy. I'm not tall or strong or athletic, and my jaw is not especially square. On a good day, I'm a six. Having said that, I'm kind and occasionally funny, and women seem to think I'm safe. And so I end up with a lot of female friends whom are affectionate in non-sexual ways. I'm married, so I don't feel like I'm being led on and don't pine for this affection to go any further. For the most part, I just enjoy the attention for what it is. A couple of jobs ago, I had a co-worker, Jay, who was lovely, funny and charming. She and I became good friends for quite a while, but she mostly kept her personal space. It was the day that I met her husband, Ray that she gave me a hug for the first time. He pulled up outside the security door just outside our offices, and she and I happened to walk out at the same time. She turned and said goodbye and gave me a very unexpected hug. That hug was potent. I get a lot of hugs, but this hug was like she melted into me for a moment. It couldn't have been more intimate or startling if she'd said goodbye with a full-on lip lock. It was after that hug that she said, come meet my husband. I'm not sure what expression was on my face when she walked up to the passenger side of the car and Jay introduced us. I was, what? Shocked, maybe slightly and involuntarily aroused and flushed. It had to look bad. Ray? I've told you about Eddie before. He's the coolest. I reached my arm through the open car window to shake Ray's hand. Ray was, I hate to say this, ruggedly handsome. He was irritatingly good looking in a concert tee and jeans. He gave an upward chin motion of acknowledgement. Mm hmm. He drove an older car that had once had a bit of a cult following, a black Buick Regal Grand Nation GNX, I tend to notice. 
Nice to meet you, he said. Yeah, I replied. And I withdrew from the car. Jay gently manhandled me out of her way as she opened the car door and got in. See you tomorrow, she said brightly to me as they pulled away, tires chirping. There were some red flags, and I'm not oblivious. It occurred to me that this could easily be a display to make her husband feel a little jealous. Some of our conversations had led me to believe that he showed more interest in video games than her sometimes, which I'll admit, I thought was a sign of very bad judgement on his part. There wasn't really anything for me to do about it at that moment, but I decided to maybe avoid walking out of the office at the same time. Months passed, and though there were still a few awkward days of low eye contact, things soon went back to normal. Still friends, no more random hugs, but Jay did occasionally touch my arm while talking to me, and I probably reciprocated. I mostly forgot about it. One day, Jay called our boss to say she wouldn't be in at work, I might not have even noticed if I hadn't had to take on some of her duties. I had to work about 30 minutes past my normal schedule, and when I left for the day, Ray was parked outside. I remember walking out doing a double take as I recognized the car, and for a heartbeat, I started to walk towards the car, even though I thought better of it. One stride shifted his way then immediately back on course to my own waiting car. He spotted me and got out of his car and moved to intercept me, so I of course corrected again to meet him part way. Hey, it's Ray, right? What's up? Where's Jay? I don't know, man. She called in. She called in sick? I guess sick. I didn't take the call. Well... Where is she? I don't know, man. I've been here all day. So, you don't know where she is? Ray asked, emphasizing the you. I really don't. I mean, have you been home? Yeah, I've been home. Okay. Look, I'm sorry. I tell you to talk to our boss, Claire, but she's already left. He was silent and fidgety for a minute, as if coming to a decision. If she calls you, you tell her to call me. I don't think she has my number, I said truthfully. <sighs> he made a sound of disbelief. Tell her, he said, and walked back to his car. I saw him get in his car and pull away from his parking spot as I was getting into my car. I started getting into my vehicle and began to drive towards home and soon spotted his car behind mine. Coincidence? I seem to recall Jay telling me that she lived north of the office, and I was heading southwest. I decided then to do something stupid. I took a last second turn into a motel parking lot. I wasn't sure where my brain was going, except that I wanted to know for certain if he was following me. He'd been a few cars behind me, so he'd had time to make his turns with less drama. There was another exit from the lot, so I aimed for it, and was soon back out on the road. He had to know he'd been spotted, so either he was going to stop following me, or escalate the situation. He was on my tail. All pretenses dropped. He was following me now with no cars between us, and his car had a lot more horsepower than mine did. It was seriously lucky that I spotted two police vehicles parked in a parking lot, and I made a beeline for them, fast honking a few times as I approached. Four officers got out the cars and unsapped the buttons on their gun holsters as I pulled in with Ray right behind me. I stayed in my car, both hands on the steering wheel. Ray got out of his. I don't know what the hell he was thinking. But even as the officers were telling him to get back into his car, he was walking towards mine, yelling, Is she in that hotel? Were you meeting her there? How long have you two been screwing each other? 
The police understood the situation very quickly and interposed themselves. One of the four came to my car and asked me to exit the vehicle slowly and asked me to explain the situation. Ray offered yelling complimentary as I was explaining what I knew and at one point started to try to come my way pushing past an officer who was not having any of it. Ray was in the back of the cruiser with bracelets reassuringly fast. It's a bit of a blur from there. I think the cops talked to me for 30 more minutes and only lectured me slightly on the way I'd driven towards their cars in the parking lot, cutting across lanes and honking. As for Ray, he should not have tried to shove a policeman out the way. I'm pretty certain the cops did not believe me that I was not screwing Jay. Have you ever recognized that you weren't thinking clearly? but were unable to do anything about it? Intellectually, I knew it didn't matter whether they believed me or not, but on some level, I was seething about it for days. I spoke to Claire the next morning at the office and told her that I'd like the security guards at the office to walk me out to my car for a while. We didn't see Jay until a week later. She came in to clear out her desk. She'd quit and was going away. Beyond that, she wouldn't speak to me, and I haven't seen her or Ray since. I grew up on an island in Alaska and lived on the same property since birth to high school graduation. Our house had two stories and the downstairs had a bathroom, furnace room, storage room, entryway, and rec room. One of the walls had some plywood pieces up so that we could feed extension cords through it to our crawl space. We had a C-shaped driveway that you could enter from one side and then park in the carport and then just drive towards the exit. The crawl space consisted of two big water tanks because we caught our own rainwater. We also used this area for storage. The space was 10 by 15, but only three feet high. You had to lift a cover up to get into the water tanks and you could only enter the crawl space from the side of the house. It was a two by two door that we kept a master lock on, but never actually locked. Our dog Brewster had an area to the side of the house as well. He had a big fenced area, his own stairway and porch, which was half covered and he had a dog house. During the summer, we had black bears in our yard most nights and Brewster would give a quick bark to let them on their way. We knew his barks. There were four of us in the family, my parents, myself and my older brother who is two years older and has Down syndrome. My brother was in special education at school and there were other kids who would come into the same room but just once in a while throughout the day because they had similar disabilities and were able to keep up some of their general classes. But some of the kids had discipline problems or mental illness. My brother was loved by the school kids and everyone knew him. One day a native kid that was about 15 came to our door and wanted to play with Travis. We thought it was odd because Travis had moderate downs and he didn't really like playing with other kids. He liked watching kids play. Travis liked watching movies and listening to music. My mum asked the kid what his name was and he said he was Mark and he knew Travis from junior high the year prior because he would go into Travis's class sometimes for help with his homework. I remember him staring at me a little too much and he didn't seem like someone who was mentally challenged. My mother let him come in but kept a watchful eye on them. Travis seemed like he didn't want him there and my mum told Mark that we were having dinner soon and told him it was time for him to go. My mum found out that he had moved into the area where we lived, but it was still a little away. He had been in and out of foster care for most of his life. 
His parents were abusive addicts. I think he came over another time and my mum felt bad for him, and she really felt as if something was off. She felt like he was coming over because of me. My mum politely told him that Travis didn't really like having visitors, and he seemed okay with that, and never came over again. My parents went to a church service on Wednesday evenings and would be gone a couple of hours. I would stay home with Travis. At the time I was 11 and he was 13. I started helping out the church nursery when I was 9 and when I turned 11, my best friend and I took a babysitting course which included CPR and first aid. We would babysit together and at age 12 started babysitting on our own. My mum was a homemaker and would always be home except for Wednesday's church service. My parents didn't drink, didn't do drugs nor smoke, and I can only remember my parents going out a few times when we were in need of a babysitter. I would leave the downstairs door unlocked for my parents when they were going to be gone only a couple of hours. I was expecting them home in half an hour and was surprised when I heard the downstairs door open. I thought I must not have heard the car pull up and Travis was up past his bedtime so I quietly tell Travis to go to his bedroom and get to bed. I start walking through the kitchen to the top of the stairs and I call out, Mum? Dad? And I hear the footsteps stop and I'm looking down the stairs and I can see men's work boots and jeans. This is not my parents. The way the stairs are set up, you could see the bottom half of someone without descending the stairs. I'm scared to death and I run to Travis who is going down the hall and I grab him and drag him to my parents bedroom because it's the only room that locks and has a phone. Now I don't mean this in a rude way but down kids can be very stubborn so my brother just wants to go to his room but I get him to sit down on the bed and I'm trying to keep him in the room whilst I'm grabbing a gun and I call my neighbour. I can hear him walking around downstairs still. My neighbour answers her phone immediately and I whisper to her that someone is in the house and that I'm scared. She told me to come out onto the front porch and she'll be there. I get the courage to run down the door and I get outside. Thankfully she's in our driveway and she has her hound dog with her. She lets me know that she's going to enter the house through the downstairs. She disappears from sight but comes back quickly and tells me that the door is locked so she makes her way upstairs. She gets to the top when we hear the downstairs door open and the crunching of gravel as the intruder runs off. She lets go of her dog and the dog chases the person into the woods. The dog came back 10 minutes later and our neighbour sat with us until my parents got home. The police were never called because I think my parents assumed it was a neighbour's boy screwing with me. We live in a safe place where the only thing you have to worry about are bears and an occasional wolf. A week after this incident, our dog would bark for 15 minutes after we went to bed consistently every night. We would look out the windows and saw nothing. We figured it was bears because it was springtime and Brewster's was probably just getting used to them again. A couple of months the barking still happened. I had my best friend stay the night and we would always stay in the downstairs so that we can be louder and stay up as late as we'd like. Kate had a brother that was seven years older and we'd ask him to bring us booze. All the kids were starting their vices at our age. It was a little after midnight and her brother never showed up and Brewster never barked that night either. We were sitting on the stairs braiding each other's hair when we both got a feeling as if someone were looking at us. We looked over and there was a guy staring into the window. We ran upstairs in panic. We thought perhaps it was her brother but he wouldn't have come to the window and spy on us. The face also seemed a bit darker than his, but we had the lights on downstairs and there were no lights by that window outside. 
so it was hard to tell who it was. We didn't want to wake my parents up just in case it was her brother. So we waited 30 minutes and went back down to grab our stuff and went to sleep in my bedroom for the night. The next day we spoke to her brother and he said it wasn't him. That night, Brewster's was back to barking again. Two more months go by and I had gone to bed and heard Brewster's bark and I looked out my window and as usual didn't see anything. I had just dozed off again and woke up to Brewster's barking frantically. I looked out my window and I see a guy running out of our driveway. I thought about waking my parents but we had a trail on the side of our house that kids used to use to run to the road behind ours. The neighborhood was on the side of a mountain so all the kids used trails to get straight through to another road instead of using the main roads. I'd never seen someone come out of that part of the driveway because the trail was on the south side of the house along with the crawl space and Brewster's area. My room was the only room on the north side. I decided to go back to sleep and was tossing and turning. 15 minutes go by and I smell smoke. I go to the hall and the smell is a lot stronger and it's starting to get hazy in Travis's room which was directly across from mine. I scream fire fire wake up. My parents are up but Travis doesn't want to get out of bed but thank god for the strength of adrenaline. We get outside and the flames are pouring out of the crawl space. We get Brewster out of his enclosure and the neighbours all come out to help us. The firemen were there rather quickly but the fire had destroyed the crawl space and my parents and Travis's rooms because they were directly over it. The firemen got the fire out thankfully and nobody was physically hurt. This was one of the scariest nights of my life though. I always remember the fire chief kneeling down to speak to me after he'd spoken to my parents and he said, Hey Melinda, we believe it was arson. I look to him with tears streaming down my face and I say in anger, Who is arson? Everyone started laughing so hard. And I'm thinking, how is it funny? That damn arson could have killed our family. So he explains what arson is. I'm still actually friends with the old fire chief's son. And I share that story with him often. Because his father passed away from cancer when we were teens. His father is the only happy memory I have from that horrific night. The island I grew up on had a city and a village out south. We lived out south but before the village. We had firemen for the south, north and the city. We had state troopers for the island and the city cops in the city limits. My mum took my brother and I to our family friend's house and my dad dealt with the fire officials and a state trooper showed up later. After the investigation, my family, neighbours and firemen pieced together that a person had been living in our crawl space for at least four months. We knew he set the house on fire on purpose. He used a box of matches. My mum said the first odd thing she noticed was that at night she smelled sulphur. We also knew who did it. It was Mark. His uncle was one of the first firemen who showed up at our house and saw him standing near our driveway watching. My mum had told him my description of what the person was wearing that I saw fleeing from our house and it was what he was wearing. Behind our house near the crawl space area my dad found out where he hung out when he wasn't at the crawl space. There was a bunch of cigarette butts, soda cans which were all found near there but because our crawl space wasn't locked our insurance company wouldn't have paid for the repairs. Because of our water tanks, the space was supposed to be locked. So my parents never said anything to the police and the firemen never said anything. By pursuing this, we could have not had a home, a house my father had built. It took four months for our house to be repaired and it smelt like ozone even years later. What bothers me the most is knowing that he had seen me and my friends undressed numerous times whilst changing in the rec room during tons of sleepovers. Where he had set up shop was right next to the plywood with the holes drilled through. 
He listened to all our secrets. I never explained to my friends that he'd seen us and heard us during our sleepovers because I didn't want them to feel sick to their stomachs like I did. I still have issues when it comes to being home alone. I can't sleep if I'm the only adult in the house. I keep the volume on everything very low and I'm scared to shower. I like to be able to see the front door and I have night terrors to this day. I'm 34 now and I've been dealing with the anxiety since the fire and panic attacks since I was 18. Just recently, I was diagnosed with PTSD. When the intruder was in his early 20s, he was caught for burning down a house and was put in jail. All of my childhood toys were stored in the crawl space, along with a lot of our family's sentimental possessions. This happened in the year 2000. I was 21, living with my best friend in a two-bedroom apartment in a pretty run-down area. Fortunately, there was no crime, as it was all two broke kids just getting started could afford. I spent my days juggling classes at the local community college and working retail. I was single at the time and would often spend my time online all night on chat rooms. I had met this girl in a local chat room, and we had been hitting it off, or so it seemed. I would email her, and we would chat. She had me send a few pictures, and I was really into her. Pretty, with a thick, curvy body. Pretty much my type. Her name was Beth, and she had told me Beth by Kiss was her favorite song. This one rainy night in February, we were talking, and she had asked me to come over. She lived a few towns away, maybe an hour away. Like I said earlier, we had been hitting it off, and honestly, I found myself liking Beth a lot. So I jumped at the chance to actually meet her in person. We made plans for me to pick her up and go to a Waffle House. I showered and got dressed. Nothing too fancy. One of those long sleeve shirts with the stripe across the chest. Jeans, a hoodie. I didn't want to overdo it, but still looked decent. By the time I left, it was almost 11, and my roommate was asleep in his room. I headed out excited and nervous. In hindsight, I should have stayed home. It took a lot longer to get there than I thought it would, probably thanks to the rain. But sure enough, her directions took me right to her place. A double wide trailer in a rural area trailer park. I walked up the stairs of the front porch and knocked on the door. I've always been pretty shy when talking to girls I liked, and I was still nervous when she opened the door. The door opened just a little and a little voice told me to come in. I walked in apologizing for taking so long and a little bit nervous days. She said it was okay and to have a seat. I sat on the couch and then for the first time as I looked up at her, that was not Beth. This much older woman, maybe in her 40s, wearing only a bathrobe, sat down across from me. I don't want to body shame, but I need to point out that she was huge. I'm a big guy, over six foot with a big hoss type body, and she was pretty much bigger than me. I glanced around trying to figure out what was going on. I saw pictures of Beth on the wall, the same pictures I've seen. Hey, who's that guy in the pictures with this older woman? I looked back at her and instantly noticed that she was staring at the clock nervously. I asked what was going on and she started mumbling nervously. Imagine a child telling you what they had done when they got in trouble. That's how she was talking, like a child caught red-handed. I pieced together that she used the pictures of a girl around my age. I'm assuming the girl was a niece or something. In her mumbling, she said it was later than she realized and he'd be home soon. My mind instantly raced to a friend telling me his uncle caught his wife using pictures of their daughter to lure younger guys over for anonymous pleasures. I quickly realized the guy in the pictures was her husband and I was in the same situation. I fully respect other people's relationships and was instantly ready to go, no longer nervous. I told her I was not going to mess around with the married woman. I told her to no longer contact me and I was leaving. I was mad. Not only had I been lied to, but I'd been cheated on before. I know exactly what it felt like 
and refused to have part in doing that to another person. As I walked out the door onto the porch, she yelled to wait. I turned around instinctively to see her coming towards me. She grabbed me and started trying to kiss me. I pushed her away and told her to stop. Her face turned into a mask of pure insanity. She rushed towards me once again, trying to kiss me. I tried to hold her back, but in a second, she tackled me, knocking me over and falling on top of me. She kept grabbing at me, grabbing my genitals, kissing me, and crying like a baby. She kept screaming for me to make love to her. I was trying to push her off, but the fall had knocked the wind out of me. Not to mention, like I said, she was huge. I kept wrestling with her, trying my best, and somehow worked my legs in between us. I pushed them as hard as I could, knocking her off of me. She stumbled up and fell over on her porch furniture. Adrenaline took over, and I ran as fast as I could down the stairs and to my car. As I was sliding into my seat, I saw her picking herself up at the bottom of the stairs. She must have fell down them, trying to get to me still. I backed down the driveway, and as I looked back before driving away, she was coming down the driveway, her bathrobe hanging half off of her, her naked body exposed and covered with scratches and dirt from her falls. I drove off as fast as my Ford Escort would take me. I don't know how I didn't get into a wreck from constantly looking in the rearview mirror, hoping she was not following me. I found my way back to the main road, and before long realized I had went the wrong way. I pulled into the first gas station, intending to turn around. I noticed nobody was following me, and the gas station was well lit and had a few cars. I felt safe and parked, trying to get myself together after that insane scuffle. I still can't believe how scared I was. If you would have seen that face and been through that tackle, you would understand. I collected myself and got out of the car to use the bathroom and make sure that I wasn't hurt. The adrenaline was wearing off, and random pains started creeping in. It was then that I noticed the gas station was uphill, overlooking that trailer park. I could see her standing at the bottom of the driveway. It looked like she was holding her head, crying. At first I felt bad for her. I'm a nice person to a fault. I've often let myself get sucked into bad situations by feeling bad for a person I shouldn't have. I saw this crazy person crying, and I felt bad. Then I remember when she went crazy, and the pain creeping in, making me wonder if she seriously hurt me. So I used the bathroom and I left. As I was getting back into my car, I looked back one more time. I saw a car in the driveway, and a man was yelling in the front yard. I guess he got home while I was peeing. I can't imagine what it must be like, coming home to your wife standing naked in the driveway, crying. Judging by her mumbling before the insanity, I figured she wasn't a good liar. I got home and the next day told my roommate what happened. I didn't want to at first. I felt ashamed for some reason, though like I said, he was my best friend. He knew when something was wrong, not to mention I was lipping around. My entire body was killing me. He figured she was unhappy in her marriage and maybe her screwing around made her a little crazy. Or maybe she was already crazy and the situation set her off. Maybe on drugs or something, I don't know. I cut off all contact and it's been about 20 years since that night. I've never seen or heard from Beth again. I'm 41 now and happily married. My best friend is still my best friend, even though he no longer lives in the States. We never really talk about it. Outside of this, I've only talked about it to a therapist I visited during a particularly hard time in my life. My wife doesn't know. I still feel pretty ashamed about it. The therapist told me it was probably from a little PTSD type thing, not to mention guilt from perceived gender roles. Maybe. Beth, I don't know if you ever got help or you got worse. I don't care. I hope to never see you again. And I definitely hope to never meet you again. Ever. So this is still an active situation that we are trying to figure out how to deal with. This is going to be a long story, but the details are needed to give you an idea of how crazy this entire thing is. So I'm a 29 year old female. I switched up my career in healthcare to follow my dream of learning to work on cars. I was hired this past May at a dealership as a quick service mechanic and fell in love immediately with everything about it and my coworkers. I had noticed how cute my trainer was. 
Not only was he cute, but he was very patient with training me. I was so new to working on cars, I needed to learn the basics, and he was so cute and nice about everything. I'll call him Nick. He's about a 40 year old guy. Nick and I had hit it off in every way. He asked me out and we went on our first date, and Nick and I have been side by side since then. I loved everyone I worked with, always laughing and playing pranks on each other, but also always helping each other and busting our butts to make the customers happy. I should add that my best friend works there, and another good friend of ours had gotten hired too. We were a close-knit family in the quick service department. Well, I didn't make it past my probation period, because I was just a bit slower. So Nick has a full mechanic garage at his dad's place, and I would meet him after he got off work so we could make some side job money. So about a month and a half ago, Nick and I decided to get an apartment together, and it's been amazing. I've been bringing him to work, grabbing him on lunch break and picking him up, which I love, because I can also say hi to my old coworkers. That being said, I should add that Nick doesn't have any social media, and we are together literally all the time, except for when he's working. But here's where it starts getting crazy. I get a message request on Facebook from some random girl saying, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Nick is my man, and he's in your profile photo, with you. He's been my man for seven months. I immediately went into panic mode, called him at work, asking who this girl is. He was just as confused. The more I talked to this girl to try and figure out what the heck was going on, the more she said weirdly specific things about Nick, like the truck he drives. They meet up at his dad's shop, which no one knew about his dad's shop because he never talks about it. She knew his phone number and everything, but she could never provide proof, screenshot conversations, photos of the two of them, nothing. We got to a point where it felt like this whole thing was real, and that her and I were going to team up, but she never answered my calls, only messages. But after Nick and I had a huge talk about it, I knew that something wasn't right about this girl, but I had to get to the bottom of it. I started getting pretty freaking scared when one day I dropped Nick off after lunch. A minute went by and I get a message saying, Wow, Nick looks sexy in that hoodie today. This shook me up. I asked what color, and she said the correct color. At this point, my first thought is, stalker. I told Nick about how she knew what he was wearing, and he was super creeped out. Then when I pick him up, I'll usually park by the quiet side of the building where no one can really see me. This time though, a work truck drives by me really slowly. I pretend not to notice him because I was in no mood to chat with anybody, and I recognized the driver as a former co-worker of mine that I'd only spoken to maybe two times during my time at the dealership. However, we were friends on Facebook. Within a minute of him passing by me, the girlfriend messages me, saying, you're waiting for Nick on the side of the building right now. In that moment, I started to freak out. This dude is pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend. Then after talking to Nick about it, yeah, he's the one from work that Nick's dad had a shop. Nick had worked on this guy's truck before. They aren't friends, but they chat here and there. Well, not anymore, but I just don't know why. He was saying such gross things to me, and he was pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend. If he's capable of doing this, who knows what else he's capable of. He's also a giant guy in his 40s with children of his own. I see this guy every day, and Nick still works with him. He's in a different department than Nick, thank God. So yeah, still not sure what to do about this. But crazy former co-worker pretending to be my boyfriend's girlfriend to get us to break up or something weird. I don't know what your motives are, but you better leave us alone. When I was 19, I casually dated this guy. Casey, that I met through a mutual friend. We hit it off the first time we met and hung out for hours. He was incredibly charming and we had a lot in common, but definitely had an off vibe. The day after we hung out, my friend texted me not to get too involved with him because he was kind of a psycho. I ignored his warning, which is something I regret to this day. He wouldn't elaborate, so I shrugged it off as probably nothing. So I shrugged it off as probably nothing that extreme, or he would tell me. Casey and I were by no means serious. He said he planned on seeing other girls and didn't even want to call me his girlfriend. 
I appreciated his straightforwardness, though my feelings were very hurt by this. I told myself that maybe if we got closer, he would change his mind. As I spent more time with him, I began to see what my friend was talking about. He had serious anger issues and would do things like throw plates against the wall if something wasn't fully cooked in the microwave and casually talk about how on bad days he sometimes fantasized about going on a shooting spree if he could get away with it. I finally broke up with him after he told me in a rage that he wished he could shove a fire poker down the neighbor's dog's throat so it couldn't bark anymore. Altogether, our fling lasted less than five months. He kept trying to convince me to date him again in the following months. I obviously kept telling him no. I eventually started dating my now husband. Casey made one last attempt to get me back by showing up at my apartment to tell me that he was in love with me. And if he couldn't have me, then life was not worth living. He said if I didn't let him in and try to work it out, he would shoot himself in the head. Since he had a gun, I was terrified that he would actually do it. I had no idea how to handle the situation, so I let him inside with the intention of keeping him as calm as I could and texting one of his friends to come get him and help out. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about what happened next, but he kept trying to kiss me, and when I made it clear that we weren't going to be intimate, he beat the crap out of me. Then he left and just left me bleeding and crying on the ground. I didn't tell my then boyfriend about it because I didn't want them to have an altercation. I just made up excuses to why I couldn't see him for a few weeks until all of my marks healed. I told my co-workers I was in a bike crash. I could tell that no one really believed that. Casey texted me apologizing. He said he just loved me so much that he snapped because he needed me so bad. He tried to frame his violence as some sort of screwed up romantic gesture. I told him never to come near me again and threatened to call the police. I was scared out of my mind for over a year that he would come attack me or kill me, but I didn't hear from him again. Fast forward six years later. At this point, my husband and I were married and just got our first kid. She was five and we were fostering her with the intention of adoption. We lived in a new state several hours away. Casey somehow found out that I had a daughter. He messaged me on Facebook saying he knows I have a daughter and that she must be his. I tried to explain that she wasn't my biological child, but he insisted that I was lying and that she looked exactly like him. She looks nothing like him at all. He's white and blonde with blue eyes. She's Hispanic. I told him that he was crazy. I blocked him and deleted all photos of her from my Facebook. I still have no clue how he even saw them since my account is completely private. Another few weeks goes by without contact, and I feel confident that that's the last that I'll hear from him. Wrong. He shows up at the house, begging to talk. He looks like crap and clearly developed a serious drug habit over the years. Far beyond weed. He was extremely pale, had dark rings around his eyes, was all shaky, and looked like he lost at least 20 pounds. My husband wasn't there, so I was pretty terrified. He asked, can I please just meet her? I once again emphasized she is not my biological child and told him that he really needs to stay away from my family or I would call the police. He then went on a whole unhinged tangent about how we belonged together and it wasn't fair for me to keep punishing him for not realizing that sooner. He went on about how after he found out about her, God told him while he was on meth that he needed to quit everything and get clean so that he could be with me and raise his daughter. I just closed the door in his face and yelled at him to leave or I'd call the cops. He shouted back that I couldn't keep him away from his child forever. I called the police and they just filed the report, but tell me that there's nothing they can do unless he threatens or harms one of us. About three months later, my daughter doesn't come home on the bus. I call the school and they say that she was picked up by her dad. As you can imagine, the next few hours were complete and total hell on earth. My husband came home from work early and we had to wait at the house with a cop and a detective in case he took her home while other cops searched for them. The detective told me that from everything I told him, he didn't think that he was at the risk of harming her or fleeing with her. Luckily, he was right. They were found at McDonald's and he was arrested while my daughter was taken to the hospital. Thankfully, she wasn't harmed physically at all and he was apparently really nice to her 
although it was incredibly awkward to have to explain to a five-year-old why the strange man was telling her he's her dad. The prosecution was insanely lenient on him due to his mental health issues and a drug problem, coupled with the fact that he didn't harm her. They ended up dropping all the serious charges like kidnapping a minor and sentenced him to stay in a state hospital until he was deemed healthy enough to be let out, which ended up being only four months. They granted us a restraining order that lasted two years, which I felt incredibly disappointed about as I wanted a lifelong one but we were assured if he contacted any of us again, we would no doubt be able to get another one. It is four years later and we have not heard from him since. My daughter wasn't traumatized or anything. She just sees it as a strange experience that she had. I still have intense anxiety every time the doorbell rings. My husband bought a shotgun immediately after this happened. I've heard through the grapevine that Casey has been mostly clean besides being an alcoholic, which I guess is an upgrade from meth at least and he seems to be less insane. That's nice, but I really hope I never have to see that man again for the rest of my life. Just to let you know that this story isn't a nice story, and it traumatized me for maybe five years. I'm telling this story to hopefully deter anybody for making stupid drunk decisions. Around May of 2013, me and three friends from our university were taking a gap year and decided to go traveling around North America. We are from the Northwest of England. Up until this incident, we were in the US for maybe four months. We left within a few days of this happening and returned home. Our trip was what you would expect of three 20 year old students. Lots of partying, drugs and drinking. We were relatively sensible though, amidst all this, and never really did anything people would consider crazy or irresponsible. We were renting a small flat and had about five to six usual spots we would go to where we would meet people, mostly women, and get drunk and hopefully try to get lucky. One particular day we had been to the local supermarket to get some food and things for the flat. We took a cab and the driver seemed really friendly and we got talking. He told us about a pretty good place to go to drink and filled our heads with the usual full of hot women and cheap drinks, etc, etc. The driver even told us that he would be going himself tonight and we should consider coming too and we could have a drink together. He was very interested in the English premier language and wanted to pretty much talk about it because nobody there was into it at the time. We arranged to meet him there around 9.30. He wrote the address on a piece of paper and said any taxi driver will know where to take us. So we get ready like any usual night. We hail a taxi and when we hand him the note, which was the first red flag, he looks back at the three of us and asks us if we know where this place is. We tell him about the other cab driver and he basically warns us that this is an invite only sort of place and apparently things get a little weird in there. We decide to go anyway. He also warns us this will be a pretty expensive fare, as it is maybe a 35 minute drive. I remember having second thoughts, but my friends could not be swayed. We arrive a short time later, and the place can only be described as a derelict looking building just on the edges of what seemed like an industrial estate. Pretty creepy looking back at it. We get out of the taxi, pay the fare, and head towards the building. There was a main door, but it was a huge double fronted steel door so we knocked only for there to be no answer. We walked around the building and found a few guys having a smoke outside. We told him we had been invited by a cab driver and described him. They knew who we were talking about and told us to wait outside while they fetched him. Note that all these people were not welcoming or polite. They actually were pretty strange and seemed like they were trying to intimidate us. The taxi guy comes out and isn't as happy as earlier in the day but seems friendly enough and we go inside with him. This place was pretty dimly lit with the sound of music coming from below. Sort of sounded like it was underwater. He told us to wait while he went into a room and he came out with a stamp and stamped our hands. I remember the stamp was an orange circle with an X in the middle. Didn't think anything of it, just a small detail I remember. He tells us to follow him and as he promised there was a pretty large area full of people dancing 
and seemingly having a good time, but something about it seemed very off. It was as if it was either scripted or all of these people were just really tripping. It turns out to be the latter. We start drinking and making small talk with people who were either too messed up to converse or just didn't seem interested in talking with us. So we made our own fun, started drinking a lot and tried to source some drugs. We found the taxi guy and he told us to give him some money and he would bring back some good old stuff. So we did. He stuck to his word and about 30 minutes later we were pretty messed up but still enjoying ourselves. Here's where the night takes a turn though. A guy approached us in a long jacket and asks us some questions. Where are you guys from? Are we armed? And some others that I can't remember. Pretty weird but we brushed it off. A few more guys who were his friends started talking with us and after a while we agreed we would go back to their place for sort of an after party which was literally the worst mistake of my life. We get in a truck with these guys, and there were a few more following us. Seemed pretty normal at this point, until we realized that nobody else in the truck was talking except us, and there was no music. I started to panic a little at this point, and I suggested maybe we should get out because we didn't know where we were, and we should be getting back. My two friends didn't argue, but the guy driving the truck just completely ignored us. We get back to this sort of studio apartment with two floors. It was a very open floor plan, except for a few chairs, and some weird random art pictures popped up on wooden mounts. Again, no music. Kind of weird at this point. I basically said to my friend something like, let's just slip out for a cigarette and then we'll leave. They wouldn't let us leave, basically telling us to have a good time and chill out till the others arrived. We were all pretty worried at this point, even though we hadn't been threatened or anything, something just seemed really off until one of the guys who had not said a word the entire drive came and sat near us and plainly asks my friend while taking a hold of his wrist, how much would I have to pay you to watch you slit your wrists? We didn't know what to say and tried to awkwardly laugh it off. At this point, the drug and alcohol effects are wearing off and I realize what a bad situation this is. I stand up and say we really need to leave because we are busy the next day, only to be told that we have to stay for a while. It wasn't an order as such, but it may as well have been. We flat out don't drink anything at this point, and we can't even talk amongst ourselves because the guy who asked about my friend's wrist is basically sitting right in between us. The taxi guy is nowhere to be seen. Another group of people arrived, and they were dressed really strange, to us at least wearing long coats and huge boots, fingerless gloves, usually something we would have laughed about, but in this situation, it wasn't funny at all. After the new group conversed with the old group, they literally all walked to the part of the room we were sitting in and asked us if we have any family in the country with us because they know we are visiting. I think pretty quickly and say yes. I gave my brother and his friends the address of the place we went to initially and they'll be worrying. He flat out calls me a liar at this point, we were all pretty terrified. One of my friends was asking what they were doing with us and why they wouldn't let us leave. After maybe another two hours of sitting on this couch and the other groups of people standing in little groups and turning and shooting us looks every now and then, I get up and I ask what time it is and I need to be going. I basically get told to go sit back down and I don't need to be worrying about the time. Then the taxi guy comes in the room and straight away we make eye contact. He mouthed something to me, but I couldn't really make it out. But I knew whatever it was, it was not good. I stand up and walk towards him. He meets me halfway and tells me he isn't allowed to be talking to me and that he is sorry. At this point, I'm considering we might die in this place in some sort of crazy horror movie style cult killing. I return to my friends and tell them I think they will do something really bad if we don't find a way to leave. I remember the studio wasn't very high up in the building maybe one or two flights of stairs, and that the main door was open when we arrived. One of my friends stood up and basically said something along the lines of, look, whatever you are doing, either do it now or let us leave. Literally everybody except us and the taxi guy started laughing hysterically. Fear started turning pretty quickly into anger, and I basically said to my friends, screw this, let's just walk past them. As we approach the door, one guy pretty much stands and blocks the door. In my head, I thought if I shove him 
open the door and run, maybe we will get out. But basically before I got the chance, the whole group started beating us up. Spitting, kicking, pretty much everything. I remember the taxi guy trying to drag guys off of us, but that was it. After they beat us up, I remember being dragged back down the same stairs as we were brought in. And I also remember seeing my friends be dragged behind me as I was facing the opposite way. It was light outside at this point, as I see the main door. We were urinated on when we go outside, and had petrol poured on us. At this point, I thought I was about to be burned alive, and I was sobbing. My friends the same. The whole ordeal ended a few minutes later. The guys got into the same trucks and left. We were bloody, covered in piss and petrol, and terrified. We basically ran the first chance we got. When the guys drove away in the truck, it took us about two hours of walking until we came across a petrol station. The man working there was horrified and called the police who arrived relatively quick. He asked us if we could remember where this happened and we no longer had the piece of paper with the address to the place on it and none of us could remember the name. We were still pretty shook up but we managed to direct them back to the building we were locked in, still covered in piss and petrol. None of the injuries we got from being beat up were very bad, just some bruises and a couple of cuts. We told the story maybe five or six times altogether, and were later informed of some other tourists who reported something very similar. The building we were in was used for art shows, and the locks to the studio we were in had been smashed off. This basically sparked agoraphobia with me. And after returning to the UK a few days later, it probably ruined the best part of my 20s and still to this day traumatizes me. But having a son and a family has helped me greatly, whether it was a gang of lunatics just trying to terrify us or whether they had other plans for us, but something happened, I don't know. But it was the most terrifying time of my life. One of my two best friends also had to seek counseling for this and the other basically will not talk about it, but it'll be one day that we'll never forget. This happened yesterday, so I'm still shaken up by it, especially after this morning. Yesterday I was waiting at my train station, sitting on the floor under a tree. I had my art poster tube carrier with me, and nothing else. I'm a fine arts university student, and I was on my way to class that day. I was listening to music and looking at my phone when I got this weird vibe that somebody was looking at me. I snuck a peek a couple of times and saw a man walking up the ramp to the train station. He passed in front of me, walked a couple of steps forward and then turned around and walked my direction. I took my headphones out and looked up. He was a tall lanky man who looked to be in his mid-thirties. He was balding with almost shaved hair. He had these round glasses and thin frames, sporting a brown shirt with a rainbow collar, and his vibe was intensely uncomfortable. He quickly started talking to me, in English, not my country's language, and he asked if he could see my drawings. I found it weird, and though I have had a few people ask me to see my art, it was always while I was drawing. Nobody ever asked me to open my art carrier. Most people don't even recognize what it is. I, nevertheless, said okay, thinking nothing of it. I took out two of them and showed the man saying, it's nothing special, they're just exercises, following with. I'm an art student, and I really regret saying this now. There's only one art university where I live. The man complimented what I had shown him and sat next to me on the floor. This was my first sign to get out of there, but then again, I never learn, do I? The man proceeded to tell me about him. He said he had been in the country for a year and that he has no friends. He complimented me on my style, I'm sort of a rock metal loving person, and asked me what kind of music I listen to. I realize this sounds like a normal conversation, but where I live it's not normal to start talking to strangers, and the specific way in which he phrased everything was downright weird and intrusive. Also everything had a hint of self-loathing. Now I've had a couple of bad experiences in my life with creepy men and I couldn't shake off the feeling that there was something deeply wrong with this man. Like a certain sickly charm that only comes from a twisted individual. He focused the conversation a lot on himself until he asked me if I was nervous. 
I replied a little, as it's not normal for someone to start up a conversation just like that. At least not where I'm from. He said it was cute and started making weird excuses as to why he was randomly talking to me. It was cute that I was scared. He said he was from Belgium and was on paid leave for a month to go to a psychologist. He said the reason was that he was too good at his job and nobody gave him credit so he had low self-esteem. As the train arrives, I point to it and say, this is my train, expecting him to stay. But this man follows me and continues to talk like it was nothing, which at this point I become less and less responsive to. This man clearly had a superiority complex. He complained about being the best at his job and highly educated and that nobody gave him enough credit or a raise, so much that it made it weird and awkward. He repeatedly pointed out that I was nervous, saying how he knew that if I was nervous, then that meant I was more honest. He kept getting closer to me and I kept stepping away, wishing he would just give up, but alas my stop came and he followed me. I tried saying I have to go and he followed me. I do admit I was polite the whole time, but I was in public and didn't want to cause a scene. Maybe I should have in hindsight. We got off the train station and he started asking more and more intrusive questions, ending it with a, will you go out for coffee with me later? Which I denied and said I had a boyfriend. He seemed angry. He told me girls only say that to stop a conversation and that he doesn't believe in exclusivity, to which I responded with a polite, I understand, but I'm not in an open relationship and I'm loyal to my partner. He said you don't need to justify yourself and maybe I will see you later in your station, leaving with a creepy smile on his face. This is when I was able to go to a different direction than him and I walked as fast as I could, looking back the entire way to check if I was being followed. I spent the rest of the day uncomfortable and shaking from how eerie this man was. I asked my mom if she could give me a lift home since I ended class really late and didn't want to have to walk alone in the dark. I've never asked this before. This morning after a bad night's sleep, I wake up, do my things, and later around the same time I would have been in the train station, I get a call from a Belgian number, one that I do not recognize. I checked the caller ID just in case it was a spam number, but it wasn't. My heart sunk, and the same feeling came back. I didn't leave the house today, I missed class in fear of seeing that man again. I didn't give my contact information to him, but somehow I assume he got it. And then as I started talking to my friends about it, I realized maybe he already knew me from social media. So you know how if you have a business account, you can check if anyone saved your pictures on Instagram. Turns out the pictures of my face were saved. I don't have many on there, but the ones I do have been saved. I checked my followers and there were a couple of very sketchy accounts following me, which I blocked. I quickly turned all of my online presence to private and cleaned out my followers, because lord knows. I realized I had posted two pictures on my stories at that train station this past week, one of those being on the day prior to this happening. And hey, maybe all of this is paranoia, but I will say, I've had my fair share of ill-intentioned men, and this guy gave me the same exact feeling, or worse. So I'd like to think that it's my instinct telling me this is a big nope. I'm going to start walking around with my pocket knife just in case, because now I don't want to take any chances. This happened three years ago, right when we were having our house restored. There were scaffoldings everywhere outside the house, which has two stories. There was a wood panel in front of my window which overlooks the street, so it wouldn't be damaged by the coating. But all the other panels had been taken off, so my window was the last one that was still protected. It was the weekend, and that night my parents were having dinner at some friends who lived outside of town, and I was alone with my sister and her boyfriend who slept in the bedroom right above mine. We were all exhausted and went to bed around 10 p.m. As usual, as a typical 19 year old, I still wanted to watch an episode of TV, but there was a festival a few blocks away with loud music, so I decided to put on my headphones. I was about 20 minutes into the episode when I heard some metallic noises outside, like the scaffoldings were shaking. I took off my headphones and listened for a moment. The noises were still here, but very discreet. 
Now, I have severe anxiety, and I'm pretty used to things feeling a bit off. So I try to rationalize everything otherwise it's too overwhelming. And I go full panic mode. So I told myself, okay, this must just be the wind. Nothing to worry about. I put my headphones back and resumed my episode. Barely a minute later, my sister barged into the room. No need to tell you, I jumped like someone had yelled into my ears. I was very annoyed at first, but she seemed stressed, so I took off my headphones again. And then she whispered, There's three guys right outside your window. Didn't you hear them? I thought it was some sort of sick joke, but she was dead serious. I got out of bed and then saw her boyfriend come down too. We stared at each other in silence for a few seconds, and I heard voices. Quiet, hushed voices. I was literally frozen with fear, and I started shaking. My sister immediately took my phone and called the police because I was too panicked to say anything, and she didn't want her boyfriend to call because she was scared the cops wouldn't come if it was a man who called. She made sure to speak very loud so the men outside would hear, and explained there were three guys who were trying to break into our house via the scaffoldings, and that we were two women, alone. Guess what the cops said? Yeah, well you can't just open another window and tell them to go away. Sure. My sister told them it was out of the question, asked them to come, and the cops made it very clear that they wouldn't because of the festival, even though our house was just a few blocks away from it. My sister eventually hung up since there was nothing to do to convince them. Then, we were kind of desperate, so we resorted to our last option, our dog. She was used to the noises of construction work, so she stayed quiet the entire time. We brought her upstairs into my room. She must have felt our anxiety because when she heard the voices this time, she started barking like crazy. She's a small hunting dog who doesn't like strangers and has a very big voice for her size. Almost as soon as she barked, we heard really loud noises this time, meaning they were getting back down to the street. We waited a few minutes and then went to the room. We waited a few minutes and then went to the room next to mine and carefully opened the window to see if they were gone. They were 10 meters away, looking at the house. When they saw us looking, they started walking away like nothing happened. They turned left, then came back, went right, came back again, and finally walked towards the other end of the street, watching other houses. We didn't sleep until my parents came back three hours later, just in case. While we were waiting for them, my sister told me that when she first heard the noises, she turned around in their bed and saw them at their window. Apparently, they checked the house from outside, saw my sister and her boyfriend, and still decided to break in. Turns out the construction workers forgot to take off the ladder that granted access to the scaffoldings. So if your house or building is being restored, make sure to keep an eye on those ladders and make sure that they're taken off each night.